It's not fair. It's supposed to be spring. Well, it's not going to make a difference if you keep on looking at it. Yeah, but I might see something interesting. Such as? Well, I can see a dark figure trudging through the snow. So what do you think it is? Do you think it is some strange anthropoid apparition from some liminal zone between life and death, between a night and darkness, or possibly from the frozen plateau of Lang? Be serious. No, it's Graham coming back from the off-license. Hi, my name's John Downs and welcome to another episode of On The Track. <laughs> This episode is dedicated with love to the memory of Peter Rogerson, Fortean and friend of us all, Heather Matthews, one of the most indomitable ladies of cryptozoology and somebody who I held in very high esteem, and to Sandra Mancy, the lady who took possibly the most important and iconic photograph ever of a lake monster in North America. All three of them died in the last month. Anybody who attended a weird weekend between 2006 and 2016 is likely to recognise this film because we showed it at the end of each event. It shows my godson Greg walking along the country lane and was originally to the tune of Alex Harvey's version of Tomorrow Belongs to Me, a song which I'm sure you all know comes from the musical Cabaret. Amusingly, Someone wrote to me and asked if I was a neo-Nazi sympathiser because I had put a Nazi marching song onto one of our films. I pointed out that it wasn't a Nazi marching song, it was actually something from a stage musical. However, in the film and stage musical, of course, it had been sung by a member of the Hitler Youth, a young man with short cropped blonde hair. And I will admit that it amused me to use it in this context. It was a joke rather than any sign that I have secret right-wing leanings that nobody knows about. But it also happens to be true. Tomorrow does belong to him. He was a little boy when we made this film. And because entropy only ever goes in one direction, he's not a little boy anymore. This is what he looks like now. Well, Greg's been off travelling, which is something every young man should do, and one of the places he went to was Hong Kong. Well, as most viewers would probably know, I was brought up in Hong Kong the best part of half a century ago, and the dear boy came to me the night before he left and asked if there was anywhere in particular that I'd like him to go and take photographs. Well, between 1964 and 1968, I lived in a place called Mount Austin Mansions. Sadly, it's been torn down now and replaced by this. Just down the road from where Mount Austin Mansions used to be, if you climb over the fence and negotiate a slightly steep bit of bank, you can find the place which used to be my friends and my secret hideout. It was a magical place that generations of kids who lived at Mount Austin Mansions used to call Tadpole Pond. And although I left Hong Kong in 1971 and only went back for a week in 1980 when, yes, I did visit the pond and it was still there, I have dreamt regularly about Tadpole Pond 
and I've had horrible visions in my head that like so many of the other places, both in England and in Hong Kong, which I loved so much as a boy, it would have been concreted over. So, with quite a degree of trepidation, I asked Greg if he could find it for me. And look, he did. It's still there, it may have fences around it, because the universal curse of health and safety seems to have even reached the Far East. There were no fences in my day, but that's not really the point. The important thing is that the pond is still there. And Greg, my dear boy, I cannot thank you enough for what you've done for me. You've made a tedious old git very happy. As we try to show you nearly every episode, cryptozoology isn't just about big things, but little things as well. This little fish and its identity are a mystery. Until about 15 years ago, people thought that this fish, the black paradise fish, lived in Hong Kong. Then they discovered the Hong Kong paradise fish is a completely different species. Last year, Graham bought this fish in a pet shop in Monstable. We thought it was a black paradise fish, but as it got older, it started to look like a Hong Kong paradise fish, which are very rare. And this got me thinking about restarting a project which I'd let slide a few years ago. When I was a boy and I used to go regularly to Tadpole Pond, there were several species of fish there, including what I now believe a Hong Kong paradise fish. And I decided that it would be a nice idea to try and make the tank in the corner of our sitting room into a biotope tank for Tadpole Pond, or at least a generic pond on the south side of Hong Kong Island. And after all, we had, or appeared to have, one of Hong Kong's endemic fish species already. So what were we going to do next? As always, it was down to Charlotte's mum and dad. Two weather loaches that have been part of the Philipson household for about 12 years. Um, yes, thank you, Archie. Says our youngster. <laughs> it's a tail wagging. Isn't quite as interested as she used to be, so... Um, Time for, time for a new home for them. Okay. I believe best practice is to leave the bag to float yeah. for about a quarter of an hour before letting them out. So it just lets the the carry the water that they're in in transit. Reach the same ambient temperature as the tank water, and then it uh, isn't too much of a shock for them when they yeah. get let out the bag. These are oriental weather loaches, it not being legal to keep the European species in aquaria in the UK anymore. And yes, oriental weather loaches are found in Hong Kong and were found deep in the depths of Tadpole Pond. The most difficult fish to get hold of for this tank are probably going to be these, Gambusia affinis, otherwise known as the mosquito fish. It's a new world species that was introduced to many parts of Asia, Africa and even parts of Europe in an attempt to control malaria-carrying mosquitoes. They were my favourite species to keep as a child and I'm very much looking forward to getting hold of some more. They are not widely kept these days, but I do have an ace up my sleeve, because later this month, Carl Marshall and his dad are going to a live bearer auction just south of Birmingham, and I hope they're going to be able to find some for me. We'll keep you in the loop as how this project gets on, but in the meantime, Charlotte has got a fish mystery of her own that she wants to solve. I've always been fascinated by sharks and also slightly scared of them, but one will always stick out to me, the great white shark. I've always been amazed and by intrigued the idea that a great white can get bigger than we already believe and appear in places we've never thought of. I sometimes hear reports of these sharks turning up in British waters and I think to myself, could this be true? Then at the end of March, this photo was taken in South Devon. Tristan Seven Jones noticed a fin in the water just off Bovisand Beach near Plymouth. Seven Jones, who is a caretaker at 
Court, Bobasan said that he and his colleagues were left in disbelief. It was sheer luck that I got a picture, he said. I was standing there with the guys who owned the fort and it just appeared in front of us. They thought it was a seal, but I said that seals don't go up to 20 plus feet. They also, by the way, guys don't have fins. He added, it just came along the beach and was swimming along the cliff edge towards the harbour then went up to sea. It wasn't in a rush. It was 20, 25 feet long. The fin looked a bit like a great white, not a basking shark. That's confusing us all. The photo was not zoomed in. It was right in front of me. It must have been 30 or 40 feet away. A representative from the Plymouth Shark Trust said, Whilst the Shark Trust loves to get reports of shark sightings from UK waters and beyond, the absence of a caudal, that's a tail fin, protruding from the water makes it highly unlikely that this object is a shark fin. Well, my old friend Tony Duck Shields always said that there's no such thing as a coincidence. In fact, he said, there's no such f***ing thing as a f***ing coincidence, you f***ing Saxon. But that would not be at all appropriate to say in a family show like this one. But in my experience, I find that he's usually right. And as far as coincidences are concerned, he's almost certainly correct. Because Charlotte and Carl had already been planning to work together on a project about mystery great white sharks, both the ones that they believe are misidentified as the prehistoric shark Megalodon, and the ones that are found in British waters. And we were planning to start work on it sometime next month. But then this story came along. So I sent it to Carl, who replied, I too cannot understand the comments made by the representative of the Plymouth Shark Trust concerning the apparent lack of an upper caudal fin visible in this image. There are many shark species who, at times, will swim at the surface with their tails slightly submerged and therefore out of sight, especially in bright sunshine. I get the impression that the spokesperson is implying that if a caudal fin isn't clearly visible then it's probably a cetacean an opinion which is not always accurate. The shape and size of the object in the photo appears more like the dorsal fin of a large cartilaginous fish than that of a mammalian cetacean. However, it does also vaguely remind me of the dorsal fin of a false killer whale, Pseudorchrasidens. I would say it's most likely a shark, although it's practically impossible to identify to a specific level based on this fuzzy photograph alone. And if I had to hazard a guess, I would go with it probably belonged to a relatively common basking shark. However, given the overall shape of the object, the angle of the witness to the object, and the overall limitations of blurry image as viable data, it could still potentially be a bona fide great white shark photographed in southern British waters. Well, this is only the beginning. Carl and Charlotte have got the bit between their teeth and they're going to continue their shark investigations in the next few months' episodes. So, watch this space. But in the meantime, still with Charlotte and Carl, we have some unfinished business from a couple of months ago. I'm sure that you'll remember that back in January, Graham, Charlotte and I took a group of journalists and video game company executives out on a mini-expedition in search of evidence for the existence of the mystery cat, which has been reported over the last few years at various locations near Powler's Peace and Common Moor. Both these locations are luckily only a few miles from where we live in Woolsery, and so it was no great trouble for us to carry on with our research once the people from Capcom, who were pu publicising their game Monster Hunter World, had gone home. A few days after the Capcom executives had found a skeleton hidden on the side of the road, a skeleton that we initially thought might have been killed by a big cat, although it turned out upon analysis to be of a young female roe deer that had probably been predated by a dog or a fox. But in this business, probably isn't good enough, and we wanted to see if we could find out definitely what had killed the creature. This is where I would probably insert a few bars of Tenpole Tudor singing Who Killed Bambi with the Sex Pistols. 
but I've already been warned by copyright violation on a number of occasions and I don't want to risk it. Bloody lawyers. Anyway, a week or so after the Capcom executives had all gone home, Carl and Graham went down to Common Moor and put a trail camera up looking at the place where the carcass had been found. Now, six weeks later, Carl and Charlotte, with Graham as cameraman, went back to Common Moor there it is. to retrieve the camera and see if it had caught any evidence for us. Relieved to find that the camera hadn't been stolen, you wouldn't believe how many trail cameras we've lost, even having put them up in very secluded places. And so, Carl, Graham and Charlotte got back in the car, and as my grandmother would have said, home again, home again, jiggity jig. So they retrieved the camera, so far so good, but would there be any pictures of it? Yes, a quick look at the digital display inside the camera shows that there were several thousand, but would any of them be any use? It was time to find out. Charlotte had to get the SD card out for me and put it into the card reader. Sadly, my fine motor skills are so constrained by diabetic neuropathy these days that I can't do things like that anymore. And if I try, I'd have ended up dropping it on the floor, and as you can see, my office is such a mess, we'd never have found it. Okay, good to see what we've got. I'll buy you all a pint, that includes you, Charlotte, if we get any pictures of Mr. Big Cat. <coughs> I forgot it's a road, so you're going to get every vehicle yeah. going past it. Okay, it's half past five now. I don't mean now, I mean um, it's half past five in the evening. What was that? What was that? The like fog cleared quite quickly. Well, I suppose it didn't turn real Oh! There's a dinghy. There's a fox. Yes, it was a large and burly dog fox. And the place where we found the skeleton appears to be right in the middle of his territory. Lars reckoned that the injuries had been done by a large fox, and here we have a large fox. This is probably the nearest to a definitive solution that we're going to get to the mystery of the common moor deer carcass, but we will be putting trail cameras back up again, and we're going to wait and see what transpires. Watch this space. And now it's time for a brand new feature for the show. It's time for On The Track Product Placement. There are all sorts of people who are friends and relations of the CFZ and people who are members of the CFZ themselves who do all sorts of peculiar things. And now, each episode, we're going to give a brief roundup of some of these aforementioned things. Regular viewers will remember that in the last few episodes we've been putting in fairly major plugs for Glen Vaudry's Weird Weekend North, which was held last weekend in Cheshire. Well, apparently it was a great success and we're very much looking forward to being able to bring you news of what happened and some exclusive clips in future episodes of this show. And yes, folks, the venue's been booked already for next year. 
Regular viewers will remember that last week I introduced you to my mate Biffo. In fact, I should probably say reintroduced, because not only is Biffo a legendary humorist and video games journalist, and a well-known TV scriptwriter as well, but he also accompanied the CFZ on the 2007 expedition to Guyana. Last year, he did an online web TV show called Mr. Biffo's Found Footage, one of the episodes which featured me wearing a Colonel Gaddafi hat and brandishing an AK-47 as the terrorist chief. And before anybody comes to kick my door down, the AK-47 is made of plastic. But last month, we announced that he was running a Kickstarter campaign for a new television adaptation of his classic video games magazine digitizer and i'm very pleased to announce that the campaign is now finished and raised far more money than anybody initially thought that it would and so the show is bound to be even more exciting and even more groundbreaking than we had already expected well done biffo those of you who hang out on Facebook may recently have seen a picture of a mysterious character with an elephant's head sitting in a wheelchair. Well, this character is called Mr. Loxodonta, and he is the central character in this book, The Song of Pan, written by me, and also the central character, protagonist and singer with a band called Stool, whose EP is also available via the CFZ. The book is available on Fortean Fiction and the record available through Weird Records. You want details? Email me at john at eclipse.co.uk. And now over to my lovely wife, Karina. <laughs> and now over to my. Stop laughing, Michelle. <laughs> and now over to my lovely wife, Karina, for our regular monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird, a highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other old world raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have, and that's what this segment on the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. Welcome everybody to this episode's segment of Water of the Skies. And as you can see, Prudence has made herself comfortable. A rare bird was spotted in the garden of Alderney's Manor's Lighthouse at the end of March, when members of the Alderney Bird Observatory saw a white spotted blue throat. These small birds have a distinctive bright blue bib and rusty coloured plumage and are currently on migration from their wintering grounds in North Africa through Germany and Eastern Europe. The sighting in March, however, is the first time a blue throat has been recorded in Alderney for five years. Given the geographical location, there are actually few historical records of this species there. A <coughs> longer than average at the beginning of March, a stranded European golden plover was rescued from a garden in Porthcawl, Glamorgan by the RSPCA. It was found to be unable to fly away and was taken in for rehabilitation. It was severely underweight, which you aren't, are you? No. Although it was noticed that the bird had a dirty beak indicating that attempts may have been made for it, for, for it to forage. It gained weight on a diet of earthworms and mealworms, delicious, and was then transferred to specialist wildlife facilities where rehabilitation is ongoing. It is estimated that about 49,000 pairs of European golden plover breed in the UK 
okay annually. So these, I don't know. I don't know why I went pears. <laughs> As if it's a load of fruit. Okay, I'll start that one I'll start that one again. It is estimated that about 49,000 pairs of European Golden Plum are breed in the UK annually, though these numbers are bolstered by the 400,000 which spend the winter in Britain, mostly arriving from northern Eurasia and Iceland in late autumn and departing again in spring. If there's 400,000 of them over here, I've never ever seen one. Have you seen one, John? I don't think so. I was just thinking I've seen an awful lot. Hmm. Especially for rare birds, of course. Oh, yeah. Also, at the beginning of March, a snowy owl made what was called an extremely rare visit to Norfolk, thousands of miles away from its usual feeding ground. This species usually lives in the far north around the Arctic Circle and rarely ventures south of northern Scotland. It was confirmed by the RSPB that the bird spotted at Snettisham in West Norfolk was indeed a female snowy owl. A spokesman for the RSPB said, These strikingly white birds I don't want your bottom of the camera. These strikingly white birds are more commonly found in the high Arctic tundra rather than the coastal regions of Britain. During winter months they can migrate southwards looking for food sources and it's possible that this bird came from Scandinavia or even as far away as Canada with the recent snap of cold weather. Snowy owls, unlike other species of owl, are active during daylight hours and may be seen gliding low over ground looking for small mammals such as voles or even rabbits. They are content to sit still for long periods of time either on a low perch or boulder. And now news from a bit further afield. Well, more than a bit, quite a long way in fact, because it's 4,698 miles away. Also known as Shahi Garud, an eastern imperial eagle was spotted around 20 kilometers from the city of Aurangabad in India. This is a migratory bird, but it is said to be the first one that has been sighted in the Aurangabad region. At nearly 85 centimetres in size, this bird has white patches on the shoulder, a golden buff crown and nape. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, has listed the eagle as a vulnerable species. Environmentalist Kishore Pathak said, the bird is spotted in some parts of Maharashtra during winter as they tend to migrate during the season. The bird feeds on rats, reptiles, birds and even small mammals. But the rat is a small mammal. Hence deforestation has been shrinking their habits. Habits? Habitats. It is a solitary bird and tends to fly at great heights at high speed. Pathak added it spends most of the day perched on a good vantage point such as a tree or a rock or on the ground. Don't snip the cat's bottom on camera, Prudence, for goodness sake. <laughs> God, never work with children and animals. <laughs> Thank you. Stay in India. Stop snickering over there. Ignore him, Karina. He's just doing it for the attention. Staying in India. <laughs> Staying in India, a new species of white-bellied drongo has been discovered in Raj Shahi Sitas Sitas. <laughs> oh dear! I'm so concentrating on trying to pronounce to pronounce the Indian words. Staying in India, a new species of white-bellied drongo has been discovered in Rad Shahi City's Shimla Park recently. It is a species not seen by experts in the country before and was found by a group of bird watchers. After examining its size, black upper side gradually fading into a shade of brown and other features, the pages are rolling over, ornithologists identified it as an adult white-bellied drongo and ornithologist Reza Khan said 
the discovery means that the bird has now extended its habitat to Bangladesh, which is very important to the country's natural biodiversity. The bird is believed to be a resident of India and Sri Lanka. He added that considering that drongos have a habit of travelling in groups, it is highly likely that there are more of them around. This species is usually found in dry scrub or open forests and is insectivorous, but often feeds on the nectar of flowers also. And that, I believe, is it for this segment. And this time we were joined by Lilith Tinkerbell. We've been honoured with your presence, certainly. And now it's over to Jonathan for his regular look at new and rediscovered species. Bye bye. Tropidurus azuridae is a new species of lizard endemic to the Andes. This species is restricted to inter-Andean dry valleys of central and southern Bolivia within the ecoregion known as Bolivian Montane Dry Forests. It is currently known from the departments of Chucuisca, Chocopamba, Potosi and Santa Cruz where it ranges in elevation from about 1,000 to about 2,800 metres. In addition, analyses of closely related populations of Tropidurus from Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil and Paraguay revealed undescribed species in central and northeastern Brazil and eastern Bolivia that render Tropidari ethorigi paraphyletic. Chersodromus is an endemic Mexican genus of snakes. Only two species were previously known within the genus. Two congeners have just been described, one from the Sierra Madre Oriental of northern Puebla and another from the Atlantic lowlands of the Chimalapas region in southeastern Oaxaca. These two species can be clearly differentiated on the basis of their morphology, diagnostic characteristics, distinguishing congeners including the number of dorsal scale rows, supralabrials and infralabrials, contracting anterior chin shields, whether or not the mental contacts, the first pair of chin shields and the coloration of the belly. A new pseudocryptic species of fiddler crab, Tabuka alcocki, is described from the northern Indian Ocean. The new species was previously identified with T. ovilii, which was a species first described in 1852, but can be distinguished by the, the structures of the anterolateral angle of the carapace and the male first gonopod. The molecular data of the mitochondria cytochrome oxidized subunit 1 gene shows that both the sister taxa and the divergence time is estimated at 2.2 million years ago, around the beginning of the Pleistocene. While the new species is widely distributed in the northern part of the Indian Ocean, occurring from the Red Sea to India and the Andaman Sea, T. ovilii sensor stricto has a more restricted range and is known only from southeastern Africa. As regular viewers will now have always been interested in Chinese freshwater crabs, a new genus and four new species of freshwater crab, Cantipotamon, have been described from Guangdong Province, China, based on morphology and two mitochondrial markers. Species of Cantipotamon closely resemble species of Yaretapomon, but differ by the combination of carapace third maxilliped, male pleon, male first gonopod, and female vulva characters. Molecular data described from the mitochondrial 165R DNA also supports the establishment of this new genus. A new species of the Agmeana trilithia species group is described from the Loreto Peru region of the western Amazon basin. The new species is similar in external appearance to members of the E. trilineata species group but has a distinct phenotype being diagnosed from congeners by the following unique combination of characters which include four longitudinal dark pigment stiff stripes on the lateral surfaces over the lateral line, hypaxial muscles, proximal and distal pertegrial four margins and a short, relatively round head. The new species extends the geographic range of described species, the E. trilineata species group, to the western Amazon. 
this new species elevates the current number of valid species within the E. trilineata species group to 15 and the number of species within Igenomania to 20. A new species of murine rodent has been described from the skull just collected on Bisa Island and three specimens from Obi Island of North Maluku Province, Indonesia. Molecular morphological data indicated a close relationship with the Halmaharomis bokemot species which was discovered in 2013. This new species is characterised by its combination of large size, short tail with large scales, spiny coarse dark dorsal pelage with short black guard hairs and a dark grey ventral pelage which contrasts slightly with the dorsum. The Bisa specimen displays unusual zygomatic arch morphology which may be a disease related to deformity or potentially a sexually dimorphic trait. Along with the recent discovery of Halhameris, recognition of this new species from Bisa and Obi Islands underscores the North Moluccan region's high endemism, conservation importance and the urgent need for a better inventory of its biodiversity. A new species of spitting cobra of the genus Naja has been found in central Myanmar. Multivariate analyses of morphological characters and analyses of mtDNA sequences confirm that the distinctiveness of the new species is valid. Phylogenetic analysis of the mitochondrial DNA data indicate that amongst the cobra species of Southeast Asian mainland, the new species is most closely related to the Thai spitting cobra, Naja siemensis. The new species is apparently endemic to an arid region in central Myanmar. Lassiuris ebeneus was known only from the holotype which was collected in 1991 in an Atlantic forest remnant of Villa de Corroso State Park, southeastern Brazil. The species was described based on qualitative and quantitative morphological features. Since its original description based on a single individual, the taxonomic status of the species has been questioned. We now have a second record for the species that comes from Carlos Botelho State Park, Sao Paulo, about 100 kilometres north from the type locality. This new record allowed the authors to confirm the validity of the species by presenting additional data that fits in the distinction from sympatric congeners proposed on the original description of Lassiurus ebeneus. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. we go there's this and in the next month's episode it's going to be quite a strange episode as graham will be in america and there's this ever since we restarted this show back in the summer we've been telling you how louis was going to set up a patreon campaign well he's done it and you can come see what he's done and hopefully support us in a very real way at this address thank you guys and especially for Robert Schneck, it's time for Archie's tribute to the Beach Boys. Are we ready then, Archibald? Well, she took her daddy's car and she drove it to the hamburger stand now. She traveled a third line there and told her old man. We hope you enjoyed this month's episode as much as we enjoyed making it, and we hope you tune in next time. Goodbye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of another episode, and I'd like to say thank you to all of you who have watched us. I'd also like to say a big thank you to everybody who has helped put this episode together, and to all of you who have supported us in the Centre for Fortune Zoology over the last month. And we hope that you'll continue to support us as 2018 trundles towards the long, hot days of summer. We've got a lot of things in the pipeline for the rest of this year and I very much look forward to sharing them with you. But until then, 
SINI